neighborhood was a place where, at times, that you felt worried, scared, unsafe, would take care of you. He had a singular vision of kindness and love. Love is at the root of everything. All learning, all relationships, love or the lack of it. Won't you be my neighbor? Well, I suppose it's an invitation. It's an invitation for somebody to be close to you. Welcome to F the Fanatics of Film. Uh, my name is Ben, and we're uh, talking about the uh, new film that came out last week, uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, just about uh, Fred Rogers. And I've got a good Hello. cohort with me. Hello. I'm Joe. And, uh, yeah, Won't You Be My Neighbor, documentary about... Uh, Fred Rogers, uh, someone I think most of us probably grew up with and never really, uh, outside of uh, childhood, probably uh, kind of forgot about. And uh, wow, what an incredible documentary. Yeah. What an incredible documentary. Incredibly emotional. Like I found yeah. myself, I, you, I'm so glad. Actually, Joe was the one who actually turned me on to this, told me about it. I didn't even know it was even coming out. And uh, yeah, we, our generation grew up with this guy. Uh, uh, 68, I believe, was the first show, 1968, yeah. and then it went through the 70s and beginning of the, or throughout the 2000s, which I had... 2001. 2001, and I hadn't realized that. I hadn't realized that until I saw this, and I was like, oh my gosh, he was still going until through 9-11, and there's even a, a process where they talk about that too, but anyway, um, just in general, I... I incredibly mo emotional documentary yeah. first things that stood out to me right off just really quickly I'm just gonna we're just gonna jump into it uh, the he, he one of the things that I found was really interesting is that he um, may he he really worked hard to keep his weight at 143 yeah. 143 pounds he wanted to, it's like which is incredibly difficult for anybody you know, anyone, any guy, any man to keep yourself at that weight. But well, he worked at it just for for the specific reason of, you know, I love you. And that's yeah. the one for one letter word, four letter word, and the three, three, three letter word that he yeah. explains in the in the episode, which was I thought was so cool. So amazing. Such so emotional. Very disciplined guy. You know, I did not know that he came from uh, wealth. I mean. He, he, I, I, I didn't know either. I didn't know that either. So much of his life, I didn't know that he had been an overweight child who had a nickname that that he did not like, uh, and that he worked hard uh, to maintain that one four three one hundred forty three pounds, be because every time he could look at the scale, it was kind of like he was sort of saying to himself, "I love you." Uh, the man was just full of love and understanding uh, in a way that's so profound that. There was like a swelling in my heart at the end of this movie. Yeah. Um, I just, he, he embodied so much of what, um, I think as a child I knew that that's who he was, that that's, that wasn't an act. It wasn't, you know, like he says, he didn't have to wear a funny hat or put on a clown face to, to, to communicate with children. And he was very honest and open about his emotions, uh, which is sorely lacking these days, I think. Uh, he's such an incredible role model that for at least three generations, or at least two generations, I know virtually all, all Gen Xers grew up with him, uh, my generation, and being that it went into the early 2000s, and PBS still ran daily reruns until 2007, so a whole generation of, of millennials grew up with him. Um, and it's sad that he got replaced by things like Barney. Like, <laughs> the message isn't bad from Barney, it's essentially the same thing but it's just not I, as it's just not as intelligent this is a, this was a very smart man uh having complete and total devotion to uh to reach uh children's hearts and i mean just talking about how each kid you know is very very happy he said every every child has deep just deep as deep feelings as everybody else they have very incredibly deep feelings yeah. and we need to and those are important those are important to recognize and so many people don't you see parents you know and i'm not gonna you know whatever but you see parents treating their kids like oh they're just not you know and i get it i mean you know people get up people get impatient and things but he was sure. he had so much patience and passion to to reach out to these kids to reach out to the young people and and recognize their worth and and helping them understand that they that they are worth because as a result it made people feel good about themselves he really did that's what he did 
And sure, uh, he might have been a bit of a square, but the man was, I mean, he was an ordained minister, and he he taught his religion through the show without preaching, right. without bringing God into it. And and, 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 and the evangelist actually explains that, talks about that specifically, yeah. and, and how much he admired it. He uh, uh, had a BA in music, so he did all the music. He learned puppetry through doing... Um, earlier puppet shows going back, or children's shows going all the way back to the late uh, mid-1950s, including uh, the birth of what would become Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on CBC in Canada before he went back to Pittsburgh. He swam every morning. Um, to keep it just all the little nuances, like uh, the way that, you know, most shows like Sesame Street, which I loved, or 3 to one Contact with the Electric Company or these things, really would make a distinction between reality and fiction and it was a lot of interlaying of the two he always made the distinction for children he was never a part of the land of make-believe right. he would always make he would that follow the trolley thing. into the land of make-believe and that's and that was your signal like now that which was the part that i loved more than anything else yeah was the land of make-believe that he allowed children to he was basically saying you know there's a time to uh, use your imagination, and then there's a time to, you know, live in the real world. And I love that he made that distinction, and he never appeared in the land of make believe. That was just uh, probably because yeah. he was doing the voice of well, yeah, puppets. Yeah. But. <laughs> and it's funny thing is, like, because I remember being a kid, and, and I could kind of tell that it was him. You could kind of tell, but it was yeah. fine. Like you just bought it, and you're just dealing with it. Like all that's the, all a the people have to, Yeah, it's a great that shot, isn't it? Great I love picture. That. What, one of the I love that. One of the things that I thought was really cool is that he said that love is at the root of everything. All yeah. all learning, all relationships, love or the lack of it. And I think that's a, an amazing thing, you know, keeping this central point. Um, someone has said also that he has he had a, a single, excuse me, a singular vision of kindness and love. Like, I just wanted to be like this guy just watching this video. Yeah. One, of the, one of the other big things that did stand out to me was the, was the scene where it shows the footage of him in... The courtroom having to get i think it was 12 million or excuse 20 me million. 20 million 20 million <laughs> from our last movie yeah uh, movie thing um so yeah 20 million dollars that he had to get and it took him i think a minute and a half no it was, it, the whole thing's about maybe five or six minutes but it was to raise 20 million dollars for pbs because at the time nixon pbs was brand new uh nixon was actually president nixon was actually going to take money away from that to put towards the military and other things and there were several people from public broadcast that were at that session almost every one of them <laughs> you could tell that the gentleman who was in charge of these sessions was the, the he was not happy of listening to these people and Fred Rogers comes in and speaks from the heart about why it's important to talk to our children this way why it's important to have a program like this as opposed to the non-stop barrage of cartoons and advertisement, which I also grew up with. And it just amazes me how he's able to get $20 million. Well, from the footage they show in this, in this film, it's, it, he's like, I have a, I have a, 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 a like a three page thing that it'll take 10 minutes to read. Yeah. And I could read that to you, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to like whatever. But I don't want to take too much of your time or whatever the point, but it takes him like, it feels like only a minute well, and a half where he's explaining he's, and he has a spiel that he basically explains to him and you know, it could have been edited or whatever. I don't is. know. Okay. Okay. So, so, but the point is, is that it <laughs> made it feel like it took him a second and they, yeah. like, like he's like, okay, you got your money. And I was like, and I literally belted it out. Holy shit. <laughs> like in the theater or so I think far. in the film they use about three minutes of the overall Okay, footage, so it is longer than But that. I think the full about seven or eight minutes of it, or maybe even see nine minutes, is available on YouTube to watch. So I watched so, it years ago and was just blown away. So his actual spiel was longer than the film then? Yeah, I mean, there's there's yeah, there's yeah a bit more dialogue. Again, he doesn't... he he. He doesn't read what he says, you know. Right, right. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that his spiel was yeah. there was more there a there was more. more to it than with that. But anyway, the point is, is that he was able to just within a few minutes yeah. get the money just by talking and showing people how much he cared and how important it, he felt it was. The man never sold out either. He refused to use his likeness uh, to sell any products. Uh, there were never any uh, toy trolleys made by Kenner or Tonka or anything like that. There were never. King Friday the 13th or X the Owl uh, 
uh, puppets with your, uh, you know, Happy Meal. Because uh, he did not want to confuse children into... Uh, he didn't want children to watch the show because it was a product that they could play with. He wanted them to watch the show to learn and to grow. And he took us to all kinds of incredible places. I mean, I remember on the week about superheroes when he would do those week-long themes... Uh, going to the set of The Incredible Hulk that was being filmed at the time and, and seeing Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno and Lou Ferrigno in the makeup. My, I have a friend who says that that used to frighten him as a child. Right. Um, I learned how uh, horn, uh, horns and woodwinds were made uh, because he would take us to these amazing places that uh, uh, a, a lot of other shows wouldn't. And I think one of the most important things, too, is that which they people had criticized him later in his career about this so-called um, millennial entit entitlement. Now, that may be true. I'm not going to debate that. That's not what we're talking about. But, but a lot of it was being blamed on Fred Rogers by telling each child that they are special. Now, what he did was he um, essentially let every child know because it, he would talk to you it wasn't just everybody. Right. I mean, he's talking to everybody, but the way he would talk to you in the camera, like is, just, it was like, like he was talking here. directly to you or to me. It was instilling a self-worth into a child, not an entitlement. Yeah. That's where Barney comes in. Yeah. <laughs> this was not that. Fred Rogers was never teaching children that, that you just deserve everything in life, well, but it was about being... Honest with yourself, honest with your emotions, and kind to the people around you. Well, and especially, and especially since um, Joe and I, I, I hope I'm not, I don't feel like I'm very uh, entitled. I try not to be entitled, and uh, I mean, I grew up watching this guy my whole. I mean, as a kid, I that I watched him every day. So, I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm an entitled millennial. I'm not a millennial. No. And I don't feel like I'm entitled. I, I don't. You know, feel I've, I've worked my butt off my whole life for everything I've ever had. I've had a job since I was 11. So I mean, you know, it is what it is. But it, I mean, so so look at us. Do we do we seem entitled to you? <laughs> I, I hope not. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I am. Whatever. But, but yeah. the, those criticisms towards him, or them, the fact is, is this man who he is. I mean, what you see is what you get. He was like that in real life. And it's an incredibly powerful thing. You'll never find any dirt on this guy. He had no drug habits. He, had, he was not a womanizer. He didn't have alcohol. He didn't abuse children. He was just an incredibly honest human being. And it's, I, I, I don't think it's as rare as we think it is. I think it's just rare in the, in the industry of entertainment. And uh, all I can say is that I'm glad he was here. I'm glad he was here and spent time with us. And... Uh, if he was still around, I'd give him a big hug if I could. Yeah, I think what that's what stands out to me when you're saying that. What stands out, what stood out to me, is one of the guys that were working on the crew. I guess he was like a technician, crew guy, and he was talking about how uh, we were just a bunch of long hairs and yeah, and, and, and they the were with it, and they were very different, yeah. and they were very and people. Some people thought he, that he had tattoos and he was hiding them with a sweater, or whatever. Yeah. That, that was like a side joke, but. But, and they would always play jokes with each other and still like get along, even though they were very different. They they thought of him as kind of this yuppie type, but they all got along from that. Um, yeah. But but it, but even even to a much more ex extraordinary uh, point that I was going to drive at is that they had he always had a really cool message, stuff that most of these like these other television programs don't have. I mean, talking sure. talking about like the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, uh, divorce. The Vietnam War, racism. I mean, that really great clip about uh, about uh, um, Officer Clemens. Yeah, and have, yeah, always bringing him in to like and have him share the pool it's, because there was that pool instead incident. Instead of directly addressing the issue of racism, because he wasn't a uh, protester, or, right? Or, and in that way, what he did, uh, you know, post civil rights, post desegregation, uh, a lot of people in in uh, areas of the South or whatnot didn't want black children swimming in their pools. They didn't want black people to come and swim in their swimming pools. My being on the program was a statement for Fred. So they would do these terrible things by dumping bleach and pool cleaners in it. I mean, that's just, that's just terrible. 
And, uh, and Mr. Rogers used his show as a platform to teach equality and things like that by having Officer Clemens on the show and sharing his little uh, uh, pool with them, just big enough to put their feet in, was a pretty big statement. And I yeah. think it's a big statement to children, too, who don't necessarily see uh, you know, or understand why people are treating these, each other this way because of the color of their skin and things like that. And... Um, Unlike, you know, Sesame Street, you, you could learn letters, you could learn numbers, you could learn the power of friendship, uh, square one television, three, two, one contact. They would all teach those kind of things. But he had deep messages. I mean, I remember the episodes, uh, you know, the episode on divorce. Because um, my parents went through a divorce. And those are things that a lot of other children's shows wouldn't touch. Now, I'm not saying that they're bad tel children's television shows, I'm just saying that because of who this man was and because of how much he could identify and connect with children, he knew that you can't always sugarcoat things. Uh, you know, in real life, if your plane gets shot out of the air, not everybody has a parachute. And you're not shot out by lasers that stun you. Like in G.I. Joe or things like that. He, uh, he, he actually went there and taught us about death and taught us about birth and taught us about... Uh, things in our neighborhood. I mean, the neighborhood was his world. I just have tremendous respect for this man. And then there's another thing that, since you point that out, they also talked about how the neighborhood and a lot of these places, I mean, this was they this was in Pittsburgh where they filmed it. And, and so in general, I mean, a lot of, uh, they, they, they discussed in this, in this documentary about how a lot of pe a lot of the viewership was, you know, in inner cities where the neighborhood may have not have been a friendly place for me. And so he was trying to re drive home that fact that the neighborhood can be a great place. It can be a good place if if we you know show kindness and and uh, generosity here. So that anyway, I this film was a tearjerker for me. It I was bawling like a baby through this thing. Uh, just totally uh, br you know brought back memories of my life and just but made me want to be a better person that's yeah. this guy this guy makes you want to be a better person it makes you want it makes you want to reach out to humanity and be a good uh a good person so that's i love this key. film this, this is probably my probably so far and thanks joe thanks for telling me about this thing because uh, it's one of my favorite uh films of the year also i will definitely be picking this up on on 4k blu-ray when it comes out yeah, uh, just the fact that uh, um, he is such a, a honest and open person, it definitely, when I came out of the film, I thought, you know, I need to rethink how I deal with things in life. Yeah, yeah. And maybe let some of the petty things go, like, okay, that guy cut me off in traffic. Well, nobody got hurt. There's no reason to get upset. What yeah. would Fred Rogers do? To me, it's not what Jesus would do, not what <laughs> Jason would do. It would just, well, what would Fred Rogers do? Um you know, if there is any criticism towards him at all in this documentary, and it's not even really criticism, it's the fact that Officer Clemens, the gentleman who actually played Officer Clemens, was in real life gay. And of course, this is a time when it, when it, um, being gay wasn't accepted, and, um, at least in the mainstream. And Mr. Rogers definitely did not want him to be open about it on the show at that time for fear of losing their financial support, you know, it, it's something that later on he reconciled with and they remained great friends they're, they're, you know, throughout the remainder of Mr. Rogers' life. And I think if Mr. Rogers had been on the air a little bit longer, I think the issues of same-sex marriage or relationships would have definitely been something he would not have been afraid to tackle. Because even though he was a minister, he was still all about love and accepting yeah. people no matter how different they are now more than ever i think in these the way the country is and the way that the, the global media is and the way that uh, uh social media and things like that there's so many people spending so much time just hating and i think now more than ever we need a person like mr well, rogers well and also just to uh to that point and to to uh to illustrate even further the guy who the guy who you're talking about the guy who played officer clemens he specifically talked about how there was a point where he was like, we, he was telling the story and he was basically just almost in tears because he was talking about how, because uh, Fred Rogers said to him, you know, hey man, I love you. 
and yeah. and, and they, they they fi- he finally realizes it. he's like oh my gosh you finally realized it yeah, like so my father never like, told tw- me and that. yeah and so he talk goes into talking about how his father never heard anything about that and everything so he felt that love from him in his so, own words too he said that uh, he considered Fred Rogers to basically be like a surrogate father to him mm-hmm. which I think is fantastic that moment got me uh, everybody that worked with him. Didn't matter if that technician that had the long hair and covered in tattoos and smoked cigarettes and I'm sure got drunk on the weed. It didn't matter because um, Fred Rogers loved everybody. And that's, wow. The more I talk about him, the more I want to see this film again. It's so inspiring. And that's, that's what it is. It's inspiring. We don't have enough true inspiring stories. I mean, there's going to be a drama coming out with Tom Hanks playing it. And that's Jim Fine Dandy. Tom Hanks is America's, you know, treasure. I love the guy. But I don't think that'll do him justice. No, I think yeah. this documentary, in his own words, through archival footage, and the words of the people who are directly working with him and his wife. His wife is so adorable. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't think that will do him justice. I think this is a film that, that you should see. I think you should take your family to see. I think it... It could cause a ripple effect. I think if more people were like touched the way Ben and I were to the point where we want to go out and be better and people in the world, that could create a ripple effect. And I think that's a testament to, to his legacy. I agree. Uh, I give this one four out of four stars as well. Absolutely. Four out of four. Thanks for joining us. This has been the Fanatics of Film. Uh, give this video a thumbs up if you should so desire Hmm. and uh, feel free to subscribe and just remember we like you just for being you thanks and have a great day man I want to go see it again